uh, since we did the Mahler 8th uh, a few years ago, uh, we wanted to follow, uh, follow it up with something that imposing, uh, and I think the Beethoven Misa Solemnis was the only <laughs> <Right>. piece <laughs> that we could uh, justify putting all this uh, effort into it. I can't think of another uh, a choral work that could follow the Mahler Eighth uh, as I far agree. as size and just uh, musical importance. I think that if it were performed, programmed more often, and audiences heard it more often, it would be immensely popular with them. It's yeah. got everything the Ninth has got. Yes, it's it, got all the tunes. I mean, it's got some great melodies in there, absolute. Beethoven wrote that he thought Handel was the greatest composer yes. that ever lived yes. before him. Yes. And you can really hear that in this, that sense. Handel's, part of Handel's genius was this public sense of celebration. And audiences love Handel. When those trumpets and timpani start going and the choir starts mm -hmm. singing, it's, it's automatic. Audiences just sit up and say, this is great. And I think that's what Beethoven heard in Handel, and and with, and that is the point at which he identified with Handel. I think audiences, when they hear this, are likely to just sit up in the same way and think, who could write anything that would take the roof off of this right. building quite the way this that Beethoven does? Yeah, there's so many different styles, and there's so many representations of of his. Uh, internal feelings toward, I mean, I think it's bigger than the Catholic Church. I think it's bigger than Christianity. He was appealing uh, to some creator that we have no idea right. about. Cause right. I, uh, he was a believer, but I think it was bigger than anything, anything yeah. on earth. Yeah. I, I think audiences are going to just love this piece. One, two, three. One very interesting thing to me, because we just did the B minor mass last year, is that with Bach, you've got constant fugal procedure going on. He could not write a melody without writing a counter melody. Right. He, he had to be writing polyphonically mm -hmm. all the time. And, and he could you know, famously write a fugue on any subject. And I think that Beethoven, <laughs> I think he found a great challenge in this. Every fugal procedure that Bach explored, Beethoven has to explore. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very difficult to sing. As I've been looking at the score and trying to figure out musically what tempos, you know, <laughs> would be best, I finally, I finally looked at that section and I'm going to say, I'm going to ask Bruce, how fast can we <laughs> sing this? <laughs> because yes. it's so difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a technical question, uh, even more than uh, than a musical question, because it's so difficult. You have to sing it where it's where it's yeah, humanly possible. Where technically it's yeah, they're able to sing it. I mean, that's the musical answer. <laughs> yeah, the great thing that I discovered during my rehearsals, time after time, with Corral, is that if it's good music, they respond. Mm -hmm. After every rehearsal. The singers are, are six inches off the floor. They are so excited to be working on music that pulls so much out of them. Their technical ability and prowess is really reinforced by their excitement at, at, at being able to do it.